Did I make you blow your earbuds out of your ears? Probably. I heard I was too loud, so I thought I would get some of you guys. All right. Happy Friday. Yes, this is your weekend, but you got video notes. All right. So we're going to be in chapter 12. <laughs> My coworkers are laughing at me. <clears throat> we're going to be in chapter 12, talking about Rome and the start of Christianity. But this particular lesson is going to be about how we go from a republic to an empire. So this matters because after changing from a republic to an empire, Rome grew politically and economically and developed a culture that influenced later civilizations, such as the United States. So stay tuned. Be ready for two hot questions. Good luck. So guys, on your notes, it does say to work with your groups to brainstorm three reasons why the Roman Republic was in a state of disorder in the 70s BC. So that's right at the end of the Republic. But you know what? We're going to move beyond that, and we've already talked about it. So a few of the reasons that we know from our last lessons that Rome was having problems um, the politicians and generals were at war. We just took a test about how we know uh, Gaius Marius and um, Lucius Cornelius Sulla were um, at war. We saw the Gracchus brothers being assassinated in the streets. Rome was not a safe place to be for politicians or really anyone. Eva Elliot. Along with that, we saw all sorts of riots over food, over power, over pretty much everything you could think of. Remember that after the Gracchus brothers died, all of a sudden we could start using, or the Romans could start using violence as a political weapon. So it becomes a problem. We also see more and more people, even with all of these problems, coming into the city from the countryside. And guess what? If there's not as many people in the countryside, there's not as many farmers. So we start to see a food shortage. And that's great for trade and all, but it's not so great if you're starving to death. So this, the situation in Rome, in the city, and in the surrounding areas is just really unstable right now in the 70s BC. Now, remember that Rome was a big city by this point, and it had grown from just this little tiny city. And the geography of Rome is on those seven hills, so everything is kind of all clumped together. So, yeah, sure, the forum was big and wide and open, but look at everything else around here. We've got all these narrow little roads. This would have just been a crush of humanity. Um, so it was even just the physical space of being in Rome was really stressful and difficult for the people that lived there. Now, some Romans did try to stop the chaos in the government. One of them was this gentleman, Cicero. He was a gifted philosopher or thinker. We learned about philosophers in ancient Greece. And he was also something called an orator or public speaker. Now, a lot of my students I know, after the test, we started working on that word wall, and this was a word that was problematic for a lot of you when you were looking at that word wall. So in the word wall, when it says blank or public speaker, let's put that word orator in. So Cicero said, hey, you know what? Here are some solutions. Now, Cicero was a great guy, very thoughtful, but he was kind of old, old school, and he was a patrician, which means that his ideas even though they worked well for those rich and wealthy people, might not have been the best for the entire, entire population of Rome. We're going to put his ideas in the little thought bubbles you see right around Cicero's head on your notes. His first idea was to take away the power from generals, people like Gaius Marius and Lucius Cornelius Sulla, so that the soldiers of Rome would be less tempted to follow and obey their generals and more, and more willing to actually follow the rules and laws set down for them by the Senate and the government. With that, Cicero also thought that the Senate should have even more power. Cicero wasn't happy with after the wars or after the conflict between the patricians and the plebeians, how much power had been taken away from the patricians. He thought that if the Senate just had all the control, they would make some super great decisions. I don't know how I feel about that, but that was Cicero's idea. Now, he also did think that Maybe we should restore checks and balances. Maybe that is a good idea. And make sure that the system and make sure that the system works really smoothly. And I apologize for all the interruptions. We're doing this right after school. So sorry about that. Hashtag unprepared. Hashtag. 
flexible, Miss Lewis. We are hashtag flexible, not hashtag unprepared. (laughs) Her sass, but I'm telling you. Okay. Anyways. Okay. So Cicero had all these great ideas, but they really only appealed to a small class in the Senate. We're going to see coming up how um, other people had solutions that were maybe more appealing to the lower class, to our plebeians, and kind of had a broader um, range of who they actually helped. Like Ms. Todrick said, there were plenty of ideas on how to fix the Republic, but not many appealed to the common citizens of Rome. One great leader came to power who was extremely powerful and popular with the common people. This was Julius Caesar. He was a great military leader who had been moving around Europe for many years and conquering all of Rome's enemies, including the Gauls, which are in modern day France. He gave great speeches in the forum. He was admired for his bravery and skill. He was an excellent speaker, and he had some besties. His powerful friends were Pompey and Crassus. They, uh, all three were generals, and Pompey and Crassus used their power to bring Julius Caesar in so that all three of them could rule together. Okay, now we're at the hot question. We're at the point in the year where we shouldn't have to explain to you what you need to do. So, here we go. What role did the military play in Caesar's rise to power? All right, so Ms. Tickle told you about some of Caesar's friends, his besties, and, and how that Crassus and Pompey had helped Caesar come into power and within the Senate. Now, these guys are not all ruling in Rome. Pompey's in Rome, Caesar's in Gaul, and Crassus is over in He's in Spain. Don't hold me to that. I'll check that out. But he's in a different area. So they're all ruling this large Roman Empire, trying to work on it together and, and hold it together. And that was kind of a mistake. Um, it's a Roman Republic. It's not an empire yet. We're fixing to be an empire in just a second. So Caesar's partnership with, with Pompey and Crassus lasted about 10 years. Crassus passes away, and it only leaves the two left to try to rule together. And so after they've ruled together for about 10 years... Um, Caesar is very, very, very popular because he conquered Gaul. Remember that money that the Gauls had taken from the Romans so they wouldn't fight them anymore? And the Roman people loved him, so much so that even his friends started to become a little bit jealous of him. And so in about 50 B.C., we're looking at Pompey and his allies in the Senate, and they want Caesar to come back home. They don't want him in Gaul anymore. They want him to come back home and turn over his power But remember, his army is extremely loyal to him, not Rome. And so that doesn't work very well for Caesar. He doesn't want to come back home, and he doesn't really care that the Senate has told him to come back home. And so Pompey's got them asking him that so that that he could rule alone, but Caesar would not come home. He actually decided that he was going to bring his army into Rome against the wishes of the Senate, Here's a river called the Rubicon River in northern Italy. Um, Gaul is on the other side, over this way, back toward France. And um, Pompey is down here near Rome. It's a little bit further south, but right there. And so Caesar has his army just on the other side of the Rubicon, and he gets the message that he's he needs to stay there. Don't bring your army with you. You just come back home. And he refuses. He brings his army with him. They cross the Rubicon River, and they go down to Rome, and they move in, and he actually takes his army into the city again, just like Sulla did before, and he takes care of Pompey. And we can hear that in the Mr. Nicky video. video. Be sure to look for that. So Pompey's no longer there. Now Caesar is there, and Caesar is going to change the government fundamentally. But one thing that we still have as a cultural diffusion influence from Rome is this crossing of the Rubicon River. When Caesar crossed the Rubicon River and defied what the Senate told them to do, it started a civil war. Between the people, the plebeians, and the army that were loyal to Caesar, and the Senate and the patricians who were loyal to Rome. And this civil war became about who was going to be in charge. Was it going to remain a republic? with the Senate being in charge and the three branches of government, 
or was Caesar going to be the guy that was in charge with a dictatorship? So this Rubicon River, when he crossed that, he started this civil war down there. And so today we have this phrase called crossing the Rubicon. And what that means is you have made a decision that cannot be undone. You have altered the choices. You have changed what's going to happen in your life. There are no more choices now. You must continue with what you've started. You cannot go back. And so when you're faced with a very important decision in your life, and it's going to change your whole future. So where you go to college, that's going to change your future. But your vocation, what you choose to do, is definitely going to change your, your future. So you're in a place where you got to make a decision, and that's called crossing the Rubicon. Once you make that decision, you cannot go back. And once Caesar crossed this Rubicon and made that division between what was going to be the Republic, the Senate, and him as dictator, because he did not obey or do what the senate asked him to do he set up lots of trouble between all the romans and started a civil war all right so we want to talk this hot question and just like Ms. Tickle said i should just say here's your hot question do it you guys know the drill by now but i'm going to read this one and we'll talk about it in just a second but like no more than 30 seconds hot question what was the significance of julius caesar crossing the rubicon river and what does the phrase crossing the Rubicon mean today? Oh, they, the most they should get that. They, they should. should. That. But the most important part, Ms. Luz is so right, you better get that. Give an example of the situation, of a situation that it might apply to. I want you to think of someone that that could apply to, either you or somebody else that you know. And you may not use my college and vocation example. You got to get a new one. All right. So come up with one that talks about. Well, you answered. I'm not going to give you any more help. I, I've already told you enough. Okay, so um, that's your hot question. Hi, guys. Apparently, I'm too loud. So this is how I'm going to talk during the slide. I'm just kidding. All right, guys. So let's wrap this up. We're going to be talking about challenges to Caesar. So, yes, he was well-loved. And... Yes, people did like it. I just said that. Of course, yeah, people liked him and loved him. But there were challenges to his time of rule. So let's talk about that and his actions. Now, Caesar defeated Pompey and then returned to Rome in 45 BC after he defeated his bestie. Now, then Julius Caesar decided to, to declare himself as emperor for life. Now, emperor just means that he's the one ruler over the entire empire. That sounds kind of like a tyrant or even a dictator. Now, but he declared himself emperor for life, for life, okay? Now, there were some concerns when he did this and challenges started to arise. So people started to resent or dislike, like have bad feelings for the way he went about getting this power remember people loved the republic and then there was a shift to where we had those three rulers right and now all of a sudden julius caesar wants to be emperor for life by himself it's like well what the heck man so he was and then he didn't really um have people support because he limited the senate's power and remember the senate has all that money so the people with all the money were like um excuse me those, those patricians, they were, they were upset. They had some serious concerns about Julius Caesar limiting his power. So then, what is all of the effect of these things? On March 15th, which is a date that we know as the Ides of March, as you can see up here, we have Beware the Ides of March. This was in 44 BC, a group of senators, or the rich people, right, the patricians, they decide to attack Caesar on the Senate floor and they stabbed him to death, okay? These people were vicious. They said, you're not gonna limit our power, you're not gonna take our money away, we're going to do something about it. So they decide to kill Julius Caesar. Now, who actually is responsible for this? We're actually going to talk about that on Monday. So we're going to do like a CSI investigation to figure out exactly who killed Julius Caesar. So stay tuned. Have a good rest of your weekend, guys.